There's an interesting little verse in the 126th Psalm. It says simply, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. The Psalm goes on to say, he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing or precious seed as the King James says, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now the application in this little Psalm is different than how we would normally think it. It's actually talking about bringing the Jews back from their captivity in Gentile lands. And it pictures a poor farmer and he's had a very hard time of it. And there's been famine in the land, but he's been able to save a little bit of seed. And he's going out now in faith into what seems to be very inhospitable conditions with this precious seed. And when he sows it, it's gone. And he's hoping and praying and crying out to God to give his family a little crop so that he can survive. And that's the picture, that actually the scattering of the Jewish people was not accidental. It was on purpose. God scattered the Jewish people like a seed among the nations. And interestingly enough, this is what Zechariah tells us, that God was behind the scattering of the Jewish people so that the truth of the one true God and the scriptures might be sent out among the nations. And we see how it happened in Joseph's day and Moses' day in Egypt and how it happened in Daniel's day and Esther's day in Mesopotamia. So God used the Jewish people to be a witness to his name in many ways seemingly with very little cooperation on their part, but they were taken by captivity into these lands. Now, when we come to the New Testament, Peter is writing to the 12 tribes. Also, he says scattered, but they are again scattered on purpose. This is not accidental. This is the way a farmer scatters seed. And so this little picture is used, first of all, in its primary sense, of a harvest of Jewish people coming back to the Lord. And we apply it, of course, of the responsibility we now have to scatter the seed of the Word of God in the lands of the Gentiles with a desire also to bring a harvest to the feet of the Lord Jesus. I want to tell a little story on myself. When I was in high school, coming to the end of my high school days, and I wanted very much to have one more opportunity to clearly explain the gospel to my graduating class. And um, wasn't sure how it was going to happen, but I cried out to the Lord, please give me an opportunity. Well, in our English class, we had one final important essay to write. It was to be a fiction piece. And uh, I had been working on one, but then the day before they were due, um, the man, the young man who sat right in front of me, his name was Joe, and he was a very outspoken sort of fellow. We had sort of sparred quite a bit through the years. He gave me a copy of his story to read, and it was called In the Image of God. And his theory was that if we are children of God, his creation, then when we grow up, we will become children of God. And in fact, actually in the image of God, eventually we will become gods. And so he had this sci-fi story where he talks about the future, where somehow humanity had found a way to resolve the issues of the body by getting rid of their bodies. And they were living in this spirit world and everything was very advanced. And of course, because there was no need for medicine, there was no a need for eating, no need for clothes, all the things that keep people busy in daily experience, they could give themselves to discovering the secrets of the universe. And intelligence was rapidly increasing, information was exploding, and so he had this story, you see. Well, I went home and rewrote, or at least began it again, and wrote another story which I called In the Lineage of Man. And uh, it also was in the future. They hadn't got rid of their bodies. But 
again, highly advanced society, but there was this situation where um, the high school students in a certain home, these children, were discussing with their father what was going on in society. And the father was uh, boasting about how amazing this world was and the notion of God now was gone. We were gods. We could do anything. And uh, he was talking like this to the children. And they said, well, why is there so much racial tension in the high school? And uh, we were going on a bus trip and got diverted into this poor neighborhood. And we saw all these poor people. Why are they still poor? What, what's happened? Why is there all this power struggle in our society? In other words, sin. And so this really shook up the man. And uh, he remembered his old college professor who was the man who sowed seeds of infidelity in his heart, and he decided to go see him. Well, when he gets to the house of this retired professor, he sees this man in a suit standing at the door, and as he comes up, it realizes this is a medical doctor. And he says, your friend is dying. He only has a short time to live. And so he comes into the room of this dying professor, and the professor is happy to see him and asks him how things are going. And he says, well, to tell you the truth, everything should be going well. But uh, I've discovered that, you know, there are serious problems in society that all of our intellectual prowess has not solved. And uh, he says to the professor, now, those theories that you taught us when we were in college, like, how are you doing? And the professor says, look, uh, I'm sorry, but... I've come to the end of those theories. There, there's nothing to them. I've got nothing to look forward to. I have no hope, no purpose. I, I think maybe the answer might be in a book that my mother used to read. It was called the Bible. The Bible? Why, that's been thrown on the scrap heap. That, well, nobody reads the Bible anymore. The professor says, I, I would encourage you to get it and read it because I think maybe the answer is found there. And so the man goes home and he goes and finds a Bible there, sort of in the rare book section, and, and he begins to read. And, and of course, I included all these gospel scriptures as he was reading them and, and how he discovers that whatever society is like, whatever changes occur in society, there are certain bedrock issues that need to be addressed. And one of them is that man's a sinner and that man can't fix himself and that he needs God's intervention. And th happily, God has intervened and provided a savior. And so the story ends with this man putting his trust in the Lord and sharing the gospel with his teenage children and telling them that he's found the answer in Christ. So anyway, uh, we put in our papers and when they came back, there were two that had a perfect mark and one was Joe and the other was mine. <laughs> and so as a result, we got to read our two stories, he read his first and then I read mine as a kind of rebuttal to his, that in fact we, we are creatures of God, but we're not children of God, and we're not growing up to be gods. But if through faith we could put our trust in him, we would become the children of God, and we could become godly. Uh, so anyway, we got to read these two stories. Well, they just sort of poo-poo Joe's, not, not much attraction there. but. Somebody said, could I read that again? And so for the next week or so, I could see it here and there in different classes, and it went around through the whole graduating class. But you know, this little verse reminds me that when we go out, we have to go out in faith, that sowing seed is an act of faith, faith in God that he's going to bring the increase. And uh, I, I confess that after all these years, I hadn't thought about this, and I was sitting thinking about some story that I might share, and I went back to that time, and I thought, you know, I have not been faithful in praying for all my high school co-graduates. I haven't. Uh, there are some that come to mind now and again. I've met a few now and again, had an opportunity. I'd go back to the high school and give the invocation prayer to graduation and an opportunity to go and speak on the gospel in a couple of the classes. But uh, by and large, I have not been as faithful as I should have been. And, and I just wondered, dear Christian, are there people that you used to pray for and you've kind of given up on them? And maybe the Lord wants to speak to you. I'm not saying that you renew all your old prayer lists, 
but if we would get before the Lord and say, Lord, are there people like Joe or people like other people that I knew in my younger days, maybe my old neighbors or old friends, and I haven't prayed for them in a long time, or relatives I've kind of given up on, and I need to renew this, and yes, maybe so in tears, really get serious with the Lord, with the hope that there's a day coming when we will reap in joy. And so that's the call. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. May God resurrect in our heart the, uh, the prayerful faith that we once had for certain people that we've kind of thought, well, they're just too hard, they're not going to get saved, and renew our vow to pray through as long as there's hope, to pray for them, that the Lord might save them. And then it will be true of us too. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. They said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. <laughs>